And did you take writing classes? Did you find them useful? When I first started writing creatively, I hadn't taken any creative writing classes. I did study journalism. Um, that was the first sort of thing that I studied mm -hmm. straight out of school. So that was my undergraduate degree. And then worked for, I think I'd been working for about 15 years as a professional writer when I started writing creatively, or seriously writing mm -hmm. creatively anyway. So um, I think that the journalism was useful and particularly the practice of journalism of concision and clarity and particularly meeting deadlines, I think. And, and also less fear of the blank page. I think you just slam it out when you're doing mm -hmm. journalism and you fix it in edits, it'll be fine. But um, after I was published, I went to a couple of short classes. I learned about voice. That was fascinating. <laughs> what is this yes. first person <laughs> business? Um, but yeah, my, mostly I am self-taught in creative writing. It, uh, ultimately, uh, would you agree that the best way to learn how to write a novel is actually to do it? I think, yes, I think a combination of reading and writing is definitely the best way to go about it. Um, I think a lot of reading is important, not just so that you can, you know, learn the basics of how sentences work and that kind of thing, but also to give you an idea of what's possible out there. I think mm -hmm. it really, it, reading a lot pushes you and expands your boundaries. You read things that you think, oh, wow, how did they do that? I want to try to do that as well. Yes. And, and then trying it yourself. Um, yeah, and writing things and then going back and reading them and seeing how terrible they are and how you might fix them is very instructive. Yes. Mm. <laughs> now, w with your, you're an interesting case because you begin with something that happened to an ancestor of yours on the coast of uh, South Australia, Victoria, uh, a shipwreck. Uh, and you begin writing it and gradually the rules of the novel intrude upon you in that you feel bound to introduce a time traveller into this, someone from another dimension, uh, as if you can't honour your ancestor unless you did that. Talk about how fact is determined to turn into a novel. <laughs> That's a really good way of putting it. Um, I, I set out to write this thing and, and I thought that what I was going to try and do was write historical fiction, serious historical fiction, because that seemed like the appropriate form to honour this story that surely already was exciting enough just the way it was. Man is in shipwreck. Man survives shipwreck. Um, but then I realised after man survived shipwreck, there wasn't that much to say, really. Man goes on to lead ordinary life in Victorian colony. Mm -hmm. The end. Um, so trying to write that story, like you say, I realised that the, there was kind of, there was no push in it. There was no life in it. Um, it didn't have anything that grabbed me as a reader, let alone as a writer, when I was writing it that way. And the thing that made it come alive for me was the introduction of something that I personally cared about a lot more than it turned out I cared about my ancestor, which was this idea of other species on Earth who've been forced to the margins of their lives by the way humans have behaved on Earth. Um, and so it was that, that sort of, I guess, that passion in me for that issue that made me want to come back to this story and try telling this story in a different way and that injected some life into this story. Well, you worked for a wonderful website that, uh, that I certainly visit regularly called The Conversation, uh, which was uh, a website that publishes the opinions of experts in appetizing form. Uh, in, in, I mean, in terms of reading and appetising, you don't change what they write to make it seem as if climate change <laughs> isn't happening. Yep. Uh, and uh, that uh, seemed to very much inform this novel. Definitely. I think that uh, all the work that I have done on environmental issues, the sort of most concentrated period of which was the three years when I was working out the conversation as the environment and energy editor, but there have sort of been other outlying patches of it, that, that environmental issues, issues to do with climate change, issues to do with species extinction um, and with the encroachment of human habitat onto other animals' habitat have been the things that have driven me to write. Um, 
writing is, I mean, I don't know how it is for you, but it's, it's kind of a, it's a bit of a slog being a writer. Sometimes, you know, there's mm-hmm. not much money in it for most writers. It takes a lot of time. You spend a lot of time alone. You have a lot of self-doubt about whether what you're doing is worth it. Um, and so for me, I think the thing that has kept pushing me on is that interest and fascination in those kind of issues and the urge to say something about them, to bear some kind of witness to those kinds of issues. Of course, the species in the uh, uh, rifle sites now is not only a number of um, remaining species, but ourselves. Yes. Uh, we are clever enough to obliterate ourselves and, and almost willful enough. Do you think environmentalism will continue to inform your work? Will it be the uh, a rock, one of the foundations? I, up until two weeks ago, I would have said absolutely, definitely, because I had set out on a project of writing a series of stories and some nonfiction about extinction that I wanted to package up mm-hmm. into a kind of a novel, sort of creative nonfiction and creative fiction together. Um, But I was finding it so kind of distressing to write um, that that it was keeping me from the desk, essentially. I just didn't want to engage with it. Um, And so I have lately been thinking about writing something much lighter, just a story of some girls who are friends. And I feel like I might do that for a little while and then go back to the sort of bleaker material, just get my head above water for a while and have some air. But I say that. There's every chance that, like, from the wreck, which was going to be historical fiction about a shipwreck, that this will also turn out to be about yes. environmental disaster in some way or another because it's I'm so obsessed with it. So, yeah. Uh, well, uh, Margaret Atwood swings in, in that way between uh, the two. We, we are in a dilemma now in that uh, the only species we've got to, to celebrate and sing is our own and we are the greatest ecological catastrophe that's ever hit the <laughs> earth so we we are fallen we are angels but we're fallen angels it's true and i have to i find i have to keep reminding myself about the angels bit as well that we do humans have done amazing things that we are incredible and we have incredible capabilities and that hopefully we will bring those capabilities to bear on the problems that we have created and that we'll approach them with creativity and what we call humanity, I guess, you know, with warm-heartedness and empathy and those kinds of things. Well, Could thank happen. thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank yeah. you very much, Tom. <laughs>